All right, the next topic is meekness. Meekness is defined as slowness to anger. Anger is a passion which seeks to repel an evil which has been received or which threatens or to avenge an evil which has damaged us in some way. As a passion, it is morally indifferent. It's something like a sharp knife. A sharp knife can do something very good, like cut up a piece of, cut up a, a carrot or something like that, or it can kill somebody. So as a passion, it's morally indifferent. It can be used either for good or for bad. There is a lawful use of anger, which is a righteous indignation which is an ardent but rational desire to inflict punishment on someone for having perpetrated an evil. As a matter of fact, in certain cases, you would be wrong not to be angry. In the Old Testament, God punished Haley for not having disciplined his sons. In order to be justified, anger first must be just regarding its object, that is, where there is a true cause of righteous indignation. So it cannot be over jealousy, some silly jealousy or some other... Uh, so meekness, uh, I'll start here. Meekness is defined as a supernatural moral virtue by which we prevent and restrain anger, bear with our neighbor despite his defects, and treat him with kindliness. So meekness is the opposite of anger. Uh, anger is a very common sin. Very, very common sin. And so meekness is something that is <coughs> something to uh, really try to cultivate. St. Francis de Sales says it's the perfection of charity. And St. Paul is, is full of exhortations to be good to your enemies, you know, be good to those who do evil to you. Um, that's, that's meekness. Is, uh, the, see, anger is the is the first reaction of a wrong that is done to us. It's the reaction of nature, just like if... Uh, well, like when the one cat whacks the other, the other whacks back. In other words, it, the, 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 it is the, the nature speaking. Uh, and but the supernatural is it's going to have a totally opposite reaction, uh, and it is a meekness is a very difficult uh, virtue to have to to acquire, and the acts of meekness are probably even more difficult because they are so much against the, a natural reaction. <coughs> but it is a supremely Christian virtue. You know, the ancient world, I mean, meekness was just considered something awful. I mean, just it would be considered cowardice and, and to be uh, uh, practically effeminate or something like that. The, the, but in fact, it requires an enormous strength to be meek in front of those who are opposing you or in some way annoying to you. An, an enormous strength of character. So meekness involves a self-mastery 
which controls the impulses of anger. So you have to be in control of yourself. B, tolerance for the faults and failings of others. And this demands patience, and patience is a part of fortitude. Strength. And C, forgiveness of injuries. So those are the three ingredients of meekness. So self-mastery, tolerance of faults and failings of others, and forgiveness of injuries. Our Lord said, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavily laden, and I will refresh you, take up my yoke upon you, and learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is sweet and my burden light. It's Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. St. Augustine said, The meek are those whom the spirit of discord never agitates, nor anger perturbs, nor cruelty exasperates, nor rage inflames. In Ecclesiasticus chapter 1, verses 34 to 35, we read, The fear of the Lord is wisdom and discipline, and that which is agreeable to him is faith and meekness. So if you see how much, there's a great deal of emphasis, especially in the Old Testament, but especially in the New Testament, on this virtue. St. Paul uh, puts it among the 12 fruits of the Holy Ghost. St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, If a man be overtaken in any fault... You who are spiritual, instruct the one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Meekness consists in the following things. First, to maintain with everyone a goodness of heart and of language. So that means both interiorly and exteriorly, you're going to maintain a goodness with everyone. In other words, that you're going to have a, a kind disposition toward, toward everyone and, and also in the way you speak to them. So even a correction can be made with meekness. Remember St. Dominic, that uh, the corrections that he made that uh, both ended up smiling at the end of the corrections that he made. <laughs> See, that, that is to correct with meekness. So you're, you, you're doing your job, you're correcting someone that needs correction, but you're doing it so gently that it has actually, to a great extent, a, a, a better effect and a, a more interior effect than screaming at somebody or... Now, sometimes, you know, anger must be used uh, for a good purpose. Anger is there for a good purpose. But the, ordinarily, if you're dealing with people who are of good disposition, you don't have to use anger. Just suggesting to them what they need to do is sufficient. And, and you know, if you're ever in charge of any community, you should remember that. You know, you don't want to be some sort of ogre and Frankenstein that goes around yelling at everybody and it's not good for anybody. And you should presume that if somebody's in a religious community, he wants to be good. <laughs> and he wants to lead a good life. So usually he needs just a suggestion or a quiet correction, unless there's something more deeply wrong. The second thing uh, that it consists of is to moderate the anger of others by a response that is honest, calm, and without malice. See, so if somebody else is angry, you respond in a calm and non-malicious way. Third, 
Three, you're going to suffer injuries patiently. Four, you're going to rejoice at injuries if you become perfect. Seeing them as participations in the injuries inflicted upon our Lord. Five, you're going to overcome the bad will of an enemy to attract him to yourself and to make a friend of him by good gestures and favors. At least try to do that. Six, you will not seek vengeance. Seven, to act without rancor, without being puffed up. See, anger is, you know, makes you puffed up. You, you are. Uh, it's a reaction that, that your majesty has been violated. Without disdain, contempt, without taking advantage of anyone, without insulting the unfortunate and without offending the prideful. But you try to win him over by acts of kindness <coughs> and <coughs> to skillfully work your way into his heart without his knowing it. See, so it's, it's hard to be angry at someone at someone who's being nice to you <clears throat> the more that the person with whom you have a dispute is bitter and of strange character the more you should use mildness and meekness in a friendly and sincere manner One must never oppose bad temper with bad temper or violence with violence, but use patience and charity. So as I said, this is a supremely Christian virtue. <clears throat> Meekness is a type of stability of mind which both in honors and in humiliations, preserves in a man a perfect equanimity of character. So he doesn't care, the meek person doesn't care whether he's being honored or humiliated because he has a stability of mind that, that virtue brings to him. He doesn't get puffed up, he doesn't get uh, dis despairing or, or overcome with sadness because he's, he's, he's above it. In other words, he, he, the reason for his meekness is his charity, his love of God. So that means he's not attached to the things of this world. He's not attached to his own career or honors or anything at all. He, he really doesn't care as long as he's serving God. And as far as injuries, he doesn't care either because he doesn't, care about himself too much and he understands the cross it's like what Saint I put in the bulletin Saint Madeline Sophie Barat we have to suffer in order to get to heaven 
And she says, a lot of, you know, many times we forget this. This is a, a forgotten principle. You know, we go to heaven by the cross. We don't go to heaven by, by enjoying, you know, in the sense that, that we're not here for a, a, a life of pleasure. We are, we were originally here for a life of pleasure in paradise, but not since sin. Sin is something that dominates all human life, either because of commission of sin or because the, of the effects of sin. Even the earth was cursed because of sin. So all the things that we have to live with on earth and, and most of the, the sufferings that we have are really from the sins of ourselves or other people. When we think of the, the cruelties that people do to each other, it, it's incredible. So it, the the cross is the is the the life of this world. So that when we lose sight of that, you know, the, the, there's such a pursuit of natural happiness that we lose sight of the importance of the cross. So that's why there is equanimity in a meek person. It is a virtue which goes so far as to make us pray without any disturbance on our part for those who annoy us or who tire us, who, who are in some way a burden to us. We pray for them. That's what St. Teresa of the Child Jesus said. Whenever she thought of, a, of something uncharitable, she prayed for the person that she was thinking of. We must have compassion on the problems which our neighbor endures. So we have to think about what problems he has and which, what may be causing him to, to be of bad temper. And we have to put up with his bad temper. Some people have a difficult personality, difficult character. You find that in all religious communities. Some people are easy to get along with, others less so. We have to excuse his faults and go along with what he wants to do if we are able. So that's, uh, that's a part of humility to give up your own will wherever you're able to do so, where it doesn't matter one way or the other, really. To just do someone else's will, that's, that's one of the things that is commended by humility. Which brings us to the next point, is that is meekness and humility are two sisters. In order to be meek, you must be first humble. You have to forget about yourself. I think that's the best definition of humility, is self-forgetfulness. And if you, if you are forgetful of yourself, you will not consider yourself to be very important. And therefore, injuries that are done to you will be considered of light matter because you're insignificant, you're nothing. Humility is constantly telling you you're nothing, which is absolutely true. Because without God, you're nothing. Anything you have belongs to God, you receive from God has to go to God. So you're nothing. So I compare it to squashing an ant. It's not very important if an ant gets squashed. So it's not very important if someone offends you. Because an ant is virtually nothing, at least in our sight. Not a very important thing. 
actually they have a certain importance because they clean up a lot of garbage. But <coughs> they're, you know, little things that could be squashed. <coughs> and the reason that it's not important is that they're so small, they're practically nothing. <coughs> Who cares if they're there or not? That's the same, the humility is dictating that in our souls. It's, you're not important. You are nothing. And <coughs> the ant never committed a sin. And is just doing his job, even if he's eating something that you want to eat. <laughs> he's just doing his job. <coughs> God made him to do that, to look for stuff to eat. And if you set out something and you leave it out and the ant is in it, well, he's doing his job. <coughs> so, likewise, anger and pride are two sisters. Anger, you know, excessive anger and tendency to anger is a, always a sign of pride. So if you have that anger in you, Look deeper. That is always a sign of pride. <coughs> that is a fault of anger. Because anger is not necessarily a fault. But if you're quick to anger, <coughs> indignation, grudges, somebody said this to me 10 years ago, <clears throat> that's all signs of anger. Anger has those effects. Bitterness, grudges, indignation. It's not always rage. There's an interior anger, like a, a slow burn anger. <clears throat> sure sign of pride. Because really you're reflecting on, as I said, your own majesty. Your majesty has been stepped on. And humility is saying you're nothing. And it doesn't matter if you've been stepped on. So man cannot be meek unless he is first humble. <clears throat> And unless he manages to calm his passions in his heart. Meekness makes us delightful both to God and to man. It makes us imitate Jesus Christ, who is the model of meekness. <clears throat> So, all right, so we're talking about meekness. Uh, meek, meekness makes us uh, delightful both to God and to man. It makes us imitate Jesus Christ, who is the model of meekness, and it gives us peace of heart. See, anger is something that disturbs the peace of heart. Um, it even is bad for your arteries because it, your arteries around your heart constrict when you're angry. I don't know if you know that. So people are constantly worked up. You get angry when your will is not done. See, so, and then if your anger is not properly vented, either through uh, the solution to the problem or some sort of rectification of the problem or through vengeance where you're satisfied. If, it is, if, if, it, if your anger is not in some way uh, satisfied, uh, then you become sad. So anger and sadness are also twin sisters because then you have accepted an injury or some sort of contradiction of your will uh, because you can't do anything about it. And so 
Anger often produces depression. Sadness is merely a, or depression is merely an excess of sadness. We all get sad about certain things, uh, and that's natural. Not everything goes our way. <laughs> but the, the, there is a, um, depression is, a, is a, an emotion which is an excess of sadness. You see, people suffer from depression because, to a great extent, insanity is, the, is caused by the fact that there is no regulation of your passions. See, there, there is a, a certain, in a sane person, there is a regulation of passions. So we should be as sad as we should be, or as perhaps angry as we should be or as joyful as we should be, or, and so forth. But in, in people are, uh, or fear, in other words, we should be as fearful as we should be. But anxiety, people who have problems with anxiety are overwhelmed with an emotion of fear, and that causes them to think things that are not true, and that causes paranoia. See, so it, the, the emotions affect the imagination and then the imagination affects the, the intellect ultimately because the brain is, is feeding the intellect. The intellect is not subject to any kind of psychological disease. What is, what is subject to psychological disease is the brain. It's all emotional. And, and when people do not control for one reason or another, do not control their emotions, they become to a certain extent insane, like people who are manic depressives. Manic is, is, is to get too excited, is to get worked up, and then they get into depressions. Anger is the excitement, and then they get into depressions. Those two are twin sisters, anger and depression. So it's just something to understand. And you know the reason for it, nobody really knows why emotions get out of control, but they do. That's why um, people who have uh, manic depressive problems, they're unbearable in either one. In other words, they're unbearable when they're in their up and they're all angry and upset and you know, they're harsh with people and everything. And then they're unbearable when they're in their downs because you know, they, they're, they're in the pits of depression. So it, it, it's just something to understand. Many times people come to priests thinking that they have spiritual problems when in fact they are emotional problems. And there's nothing you can do for them, but you should be able to recognize the emotional problems. So you, you should know something about psychology experimental psychology, something about it. There are true psychological diseases. And, uh, but they, they think they're having a spiritual problem, and it isn't. <clears throat> so our Lord said, Learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. Very famous quotation. Meekness also makes us apt to receive wisdom and acquire celestial goods, according to Psalm 24, verse 9. He will guide the mild in judgment. He will teach the meek his ways. Our Lord also said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. St. John Climacus explains this text. He says that the meekness uh, helps us to be obedient. It directs religious society. It represses anger. It calms anger. It gives rise to joy imitates Jesus Christ, adorns the elect, chains demons, and becomes a defense against bitterness and annoyance. The soul that is full of meekness offers to the Lord a delightful place of rest, whereas the turbulent and hot-headed soul is the rest of the devil.
And Psalm 36 verse 11 says, But the meek shall inherit the land and shall delight in the abundance of peace. St. Bernard says that the earth which the meek shall possess Yes. Tobias, yes, I'll get him. Yeah, he's in here. That's all right. Tobias. Um, <clears throat> St. Bernard says that the earth which the meek shall possess means that the meek person will possess his body and his heart, reigning over sensual movements, commanding them and making them obey. St. Leo says that the earth which the meek shall inherit is the resurrection of their bodies in glory. <coughs> Again, St. John Climacus says, <clears throat> meekness is the foundation of patience, the beginning, <clears throat> or even better, the mother of charity. It is the most visible proof of prudence. It obtains pardon. It is the resource of sinners who want to change their lives and become the domicile of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> St. John Chrysostom says, If we were to manifest meekness, we would be invincible, and no injury would be able to attain us. St. John Chrysostom, again, nothing is more violent than meekness. For just as water, when thrown upon a funeral pyre, which is very hot, extinguishes the fire, so a word which is pronounced with meekness extinguishes a mind which is hotter than a furnace. <clears throat> So it has its own form of violence, so to speak, and that is to calm down people and to restore equilibrium. And he continues, and there is a twofold advantage which is added, both the fact that we express meekness and that we make the indignation of our brother cease and we free his mind from a disturbance for fire cannot be extinguished by fire, nor can rage be tempered by rage. But what water is to fire, meekness is to anger. St. John Chrysostom. The meek enjoy a perfect health of soul and even health of body. So avoiding anger, as I said, helps your 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 body you stay in good health people who are constantly angry uh, are uh, d develop uh, physical problems they rejoice when they are insulted they praise god in calamities remember the story of the carmelites not the Carmelites, the Carthusians, when their place went up in flames. I told you that story. Maybe for those who didn't hear it. I visited a, a what was a Carthusian monastery in Bavaria, and the guide told the story because it, the Carthusians had left it for some reason, and it, it's just a museum now. And they told a story that the, the place went up in flames in the 19th century, early 19th century. And the, you know, Everything was completely destroyed. And so they were all standing outside in the field looking at their monastery burning. And the prior said, let us sing the Te Deum. That's, that's meekness. <clears throat> so... Uh, so they praise God in calamities, they calm the irascible man, and they triumph over everything. They are masters of hearts, and they dominate concupiscence and passions. Because that, that control of anger is uh, very effective in controlling the other passions. 
Because anger concerns justice. And justice is very basic. Even pagans understand justice. And when justice is violated, there is, as I said, a natural reaction of anger. So the control of anger is, is a very, very strong control in your whole body and soul. <clears throat> and it means that you can control other passions too. Because that is so fast, so strong. And it is at least based on a, a supposed or apparent right. You see that this is my, I, my right has been violated. You see, so it, it, it has the wind of righteousness behind it, or at least an apparent one. Could be true or could be apparent. But in any case, that's why you're angry. So that control of anger is, is a very, very important control. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, it says, A kind response breaks anger. A hard word inspires rage. St. John Chrysostom, again, golden mouth. The meek person is delightful and likable to those who see him. He is always delightful to those who only know him by name. Just some, somebody is very nice. Nor will you easily find anyone who... who uh, who hears a meek man being praised, who does not desire to see him and approach him, and does not regard it as a gain to be able to enjoy his friendship. He also says, St. John Chrysostom, meekness places our soul in perpetual tranquility, and as if in a port, like a ship in a port, and is the occasion of all our relaxation and peace. For who is happier than someone who is freed from an interior war? For although we might enjoy much external peace, if inside of us there is born a storm of rage, tumult, and sedition, then external peace will be to no avail. Very true. Ecclesiasticus chapter 6, verse 5 A sweet word multiplieth friends and appeaseth enemies. St. John Chrysostom again. The meek person is pleasing to himself and useful to others, but the angry man is displeasing to himself and harmful to others. He wrote a whole tract on weakness. That's why there's so much about St. John Chrysostom. St. Ambrose says, let discussion be without anger. Let meekness be without bitterness. Let warning be with, without harshness and exhortation without offense. So harshness, severity, and an excessively imperious domination do not prevent sin. When you correct someone with harshness and anger and screaming, yelling, a big outburst, people really don't pay attention to what you're saying because they know that you're talking from passion, you're not talking from your mind. Children just want to run away from parents who are screaming and yelling. There's no real correction that's taking place. Yeah. 
sin ceases more effectively by mild words than by harsh orders. So that would be true you know, in your priestly lives, exhorting sinners. Uh, the first path is, of, is meekness, mildness in your, in your presentation of what they ought to do particularly in the confessional. If they're in the confessional, that's already a good sign. Right? In other words, it, 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 already they want to, unless they're there with insincerity, which would be very rare, the, the, it's a good sign, and you, you want to be speaking to them in a, in a mild way, and in, in such a way as to encourage them and to... To, you, you, don't, you don't want to blast them. Now, you do have to tell them, you know, that, that they're on a path to hell, perhaps, or, you know, but you, you don't, you're not manifesting anger. You're there to exhort. And so, uh, but also sinners outside of the confessional, you, you want to objectively tell them the law of God and, and uh, objectively tell them the motives for, for obeying the law of God. So that, that's uh, very much part of your priestly practice. As, as, uh, but there, you, know, you have to be firm too. You can't compromise the law. There's a balance there, just like there's a balance in everything. There, there, there's a balance. So you have to be firm about the law of God and of the church, etc. But at the same time, you are going to at least presume their goodwill and their ability to respond well to a rational and mild exhortation. <clears throat> so sin is destroyed by advice which is marked by mildness rather than by terrible threats. So many times parents uh, scream threats that they will never go through with. You know, I'll bash your head against the wall if you do that again. They're not going to do that. And the child knows that, so he doesn't take it seriously. And then other times parents uh, have the volcanic uh, approach to discipline, and that is they let their children get away with anything 90% of the time, and 10% of the time, the parents blow up, just like a volcano. And then there's rage in the house. And, and uh, that's not discipline. Discipline, St. John Bosco said, the price of discipline is constant vigilance. See, it, it's not an occasional bomb that goes off in the house. It's constant vigilance. So we're continuing our treatment of meekness. <clears throat> so we were saying that harshness, severity, and excessively imperious domination do not prevent sin. So they don't cure sin. Sin ceases more effectively by mild words than by harsh words. Sin is destroyed by advice which is marked by mildness rather than by terrible threats. Now, that doesn't mean you should never speak about hell or purgatory. Uh, it's just to say that the the first approach in something is any kind, especially on a personal level, uh, is meekness and mildness. Now, sometimes you must become severe, uh, as prudence dictates. Prudence is what determines what should be used in each case for the, the correct outcome. We'll speak about that a little later. 
most of the time we should act with mildness when we are speaking to those who are guilty of some wrongdoing. Severity should be used only in particular cases in regard to persons who are obstinate and prideful. It also calls for it when you are enforcing a, a serious law for those who are uh, seriously disobeying. See, so uh, you could have a, a, a false virtue by being mild or meek to somebody who is in a gross disobedience or in a flagrant flouting of the law. But even in this case, our monition should have an element of mildness. So you can be firm. You can be even have a certain severity, but you don't lose your temper. So people, and again, you, you do much more good that way because when you lose your temper, nobody pays attention to what you're saying. It's almost like listening to a drunk. Because they know that reason has disappeared and you're just saying things that come to your mind in your rage. If we are obliged to threaten someone, it should, we should do so with displeasure. In other words, that you would show that you are unhappy that you have to use these means in order to achieve the end. And you should place the divine vengeance before the eyes of the guilty person in order that it not be us whom he fears, but God. But in general, mildness and charitable exhortations bring back sinners. St. John the Baptist calls our Lord the Lamb of God, which indicates his meekness. And the priest does the same when he is about to distribute communion. Behold the Lamb of God. In Isaiah 53, verse 7, he, he, it refers to Christ in the prophecy. He says, he shall be led as a sheep to the slaughter and shall be dumb as a lamb before his shearer, and shall not open his mouth. St. Bernard was full of meekness in regard to his own religious. He followed the maxim which is very repeated in his works, very often repeated, that a superior ought to govern more as a father than as a master. Now, that does not ex exclude acting as a master at times, but ordinarily you act with uh, a certain mildness as a father would. Quotations from the saints. So there are a lot of quotations about this. St. Thomas Aquinas. The virtue of meekness checks and subdues the passion of anger by regulating it according to the dictates of reason. St. Augustine said, The meek are those whom the spirit of discord never agitates, nor anger perturbs, nor cruelty exasperates, nor rage enflames. St. Francis de Sales says, Mildness and sweetness of disposition is a rarer virtue than charity, and yet without doubt it is far more excellent, being the very essence of charity, uh, which is then in its perfection. See, so charity in its perfection is going to produce meekness. That's what he's saying. In that sense, it's greater than charity because... It's charity in its perfection. 
when it's in its perfection when it is not only patient but kind so it's not only bearing up with faults but it is kind we ought therefore to have a great esteem for this virtue and to labor hard to acquire it he also said saint thomas saint francis de sales the spirit of sweetness and gentleness is the spirit of god as the spirit of mortification is the spirit of Jesus Christ crucified. St. Thomas Aquinas, mildness is a virtue in which nobility of soul principally consists. And for this reason, it is that the lovers of the world often fail in mildness because they are not possessed of that nobility or only in a way only in a very scanty or imperfect degree. If they are not the first to use insulting and discourteous terms when they are thus attacked by others, they at least resent it with the utmost indignation, giving in return language which is doubly abusive and thus show by their vengeance that they have an ignoble and clownish disposition. The servants of God, on the other hand, whether provoked by word or work, by keeping themselves tranquil and peaceful, evince a perfect nobleness of soul superior to all rude and clownish feeling. St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Many appear full of mildness and sweetness as long as everything goes their own way. But the moment that any contradiction or adversity arises, they are in a flame and begin to rage like a burning mountain. Such people are these, such people as these, are like hot coals hidden under ashes. This is not the mildness which our Lord undertook to teach us in order to make us like himself. We ought to be like lilies in the midst of thorns, which, however much they be plucked, excuse me, be pricked and pierced, never lose their sweet and pleasing fragrance. St. Francis de Sales. If it be possible, never suffer yourself to be betrayed into a passion, nor upon any pretext whatsoever allow the door of your heart to give admittance to any movement of anger. For as soon as it enters, you will cease to have control over it, and still less will it be in your power to expel it. If notwithstanding all your efforts, it should have made its way into your soul through the weakness of your nature, endeavor calmly to recover your forces and regain tranquility and peace of mind. But this must be done with great gentleness and without any violent effort, for it is a great point not to renew the wound. St. Augustine. It is better not to allow anger, however just and reasonable, to enter at all than to admit it to ever so slight a degree. Once admitted, it will not be easily expelled, for although at first but a small plant, it will presently grow into a large tree. St. John Chrysostom. In the Christian combat, not the st striker as in the Olympic Games, but he who is struck, who, it is he who is struck who wins the crown. This is the law of the celestial theater, where the angels are the spectators. St. Bonaventure. Beware not to disturb yourself nor to be irritated on account of the defects of others. For it would be a folly because you saw a man throw himself into a pit that you yourself would throw, your, that you would throw yourself into another pit. 
Again, St. John Chrysostom, it is better to err by excess of mercy than by excess of severity. It's better not to err. But if you're going to err, it's, it's better by excess of mercy than by excess of severity. Do you want to become a saint, he says? Be severe to yourself, but kind to others. St. Teresa of Avila said exactly the same thing. Maybe she was quoting St. John Chrysostom. St. Antoninus of Florence, it is better to have to give an account to God for too much mercy than for too much severity. St. Vincent de Paul, in religious orders, union and peace ought to be preferred before all other advantages, and they are secured by mutual forbearance and a carriage full of sweetness. For this heavenly sweetness and mildness is a fountain of peace and a bond of perfection which unites the hearts. St. Vincent de Paul again. The only object of a superior ought to be the love of God and the sanctification of the subjects entrusted to his care. And there is no better way of arriving at this than by the exercise of humility, by gracious demeanor, and by a constant good example. St. Alphonsus Liguori, above all things we should be meek to our enemies, we must overcome hatred by love and persecution by meekness. It was thus that saints acted, and in this manner they, uh, they conciliated the regard of their bitterest enemies. And there's a few others. A great quote of St. Cyprian. We must endeavor to imitate the forbearance of God. Oh, how great is God's forbearance. He endures patiently the temples of the profane men who outrage his, man his majesty. He endures idols. Don't forget he's writing in the, around 250 A.D. He endures idols and sacrilegious ceremonies. He makes the sun to shine upon the evil and upon the good and his reign to descend upon the just and upon the unjust. He makes the elements serve all men alike, the impious as well as the good. The winds blow, the springs burst forth, the harvests swell with waving corn, the grapes ripen, the trees cover themselves with fruit, the forests put on thick foliage, the meadows adorn themselves with the enamel of flowers. God delays vengeance and patiently waits that man may correct himself and return to his Savior. Such is the forbearance of the Eternal Father, and similar to it was that of the Son. For all the actions of Jesus Christ were characterized by patience and by that divine evenness of soul which nothing could interrupt, uh, uh, could, of which nothing could interrupt the tranquility. Accordingly, we find in the scriptures that the patriarchs and the prophets and just men who prefigured Jesus Christ are principally distinguished by this constant patience and evenness of soul. Such was that of Abel, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Joseph, of Moses, of David. And then, as I said... There are times when prudence dictates that we use a certain severity. <clears throat> St. Basil says, 
It is not strange to those who practice meekness to feel sometimes within themselves a holy indignation. That is proved by the example of Moses, who, although the meekest of men, yet, yet when circumstances are, are, required it, had his in, indignation exceedingly kindled. So our indignation should always be with regard to the rights of God and the what we owe to God and the honor and majesty of God. <clears throat> so, for example, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he found them worshiping the golden calf and dancing in front of it, and that usually means lascivious dancing. He's, and it says in sacred scripture, being very angry, threw the tables out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mount. That's a lot of anger. And laying hold of the calf which they had made, he burnt it and beat it into powder, which he strewed into water and gave thereof to the children of Israel to drink. Because the majesty of God had been violated. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the prophet Eli Elias was inflamed in his heart when he s said, With zeal have I been zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, they have thrown down thy altars, they have slain thy prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And St. Gregory says, the pontiff Haley, because he had not this anger, provoked the divine vengeance against himself. In other words, he used meekness and mildness imprudently. For in proportion as he was tepid and slothful concerning the vices of his subjects, the anger of the eternal judge was enkindled against him. Of this anger, St. Paul says, be angry and sin not, which words those do not understand rightly who allow us to be angry against our own, but not against our neighbor's faults. For if we are bound to love our neighbor as ourselves, it follows that we may be angry with their vices no less than with our own. <clears throat> so there's many other cases in the... Uh, uh, for example, the uh, Saint Saint Ignatius Loyola. Um, <clears throat> uh, he pers uh, he was very very quick to dismiss bad or unfit subjects in the Society of Jesus. Uh, he considered this dismissal as one of the means provided by God for the preservation of the society. And he used, therefore, to exercise it with ever allowing himself, without ever allowing himself to be constrained by what he used to call imprudent charity. So there is a, there is a time to, to be severe, uh, especially when it concerns the common good and, as I said, the majesty and rights of God. And finally, what are the means of acquiring meekness? First, be humble, for a prideful man was, was never meek. As I said, uh, anger and, and severity, harshness, is always a sign of pride. Second, meditate on the dignity, the beauty, and the goodness of meekness. All the examples of the saints and of our Lord, etc. Three, don't say or do anything when you're in a state of agitation. Very important. You will always make a mistake if you say or do anything when you are really upset and angry. Just calm down. Let it sit for a day. And you'll see that you will decide to do things very differently from the day before. 
Just let it sit, even if you are just on fire with anger about something, justly, just sit for a day. Let it sit. Very important. You will always regret what you said and what you did if you don't do that. Put yourself, number four, uh, above your injuries. In other words, uh, don't consider yourself so important that your injuries have to be avenged. Five, leave to God the care of vengeance. It says um, in Romans, uh, quoting the Old Testament, chapter 12, verse 19, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That was also quoted in Hamlet by Shakespeare, <clears throat> or maybe Macbeth. I think it might be Macbeth. Six, be detached from everything and be attached to God. So attachment to things, especially our own honor and our, our own possessions and what people think of us, our reputation, etc., is usually the cause of anger. So if you're detached from yourself, which is humility, then you will not be so subject to anger. And seven, <clears throat> consider frequently the examples of Christ and of the saints, which we pointed out to a great extent. All right, that's the end of meekness. <clears> Thank <throat>